first of all, thank you to Claire. I know this is going to sound really strange, but I was actually enjoying that. <laughs> um, took me by surprise. I didn't realise that you had covered everything. Um, I also, before I start, I have to pick up on something that Professor Stassen said at the beginning. Um, there are two people that I have to acknowledge. One of them is Denise McCarthy, who really took up the Med Cancer Awareness Ball and ran with it, and nothing would have happened if, if not for her. So thank you, Denise. And the other thing is that um, that man there, I owe him my life. I shouldn't be standing here talking to you. So if you're bored in the next 20 minutes or so, you know who to blame. <laughs> Okay, some of you may have heard this talk before, um, or parts of it, in which case I apologise, but it seemed tailor-made for the context of this series of lectures. I'm going to talk about my own experience of a diagnosis of and treatment for advanced, actually, squamous cell carcinoma of the mouth. I'll talk about the importance of an early diagnosis, not only in terms of the prognosis, but in terms of the residual effects of treatment. Maybe you think you've heard all this before. Maybe it all sounds a bit samey to you, swapping the word mouth for any other kind of cancer that you may have heard about. But I'm going to ask you to think again, and I'll use my story as an example. I should have known, doesn't everyone by now, that if you have a sore or an ulcer anywhere in your body that lasts for more than two or three weeks, you go and see a specialist. I had more reason to know this than most people, because 20 years ago, my sister Lynn developed a painful lump in her left breast. She was told by several doctors over the course of a year where her health deteriorated, she lost energy, that her lump was benign. They never even did a biopsy. By the time she made it to the casualty department of her local hospital, the cancer that had been in her breast all along had spread to her liver. She was dead three weeks later. She was 33 years old. So you see, I really thought I knew. And I was very aware of breast cancer in particular. And I used to go for regular checkups at a breast clinic, just to be sure. But I didn't know it was possible to get cancer of the mouth. I'd never heard of it. What's more, and I know how stupid this sounds, especially to you, but I didn't really recognize my mouth as having the potential for disease. Pain, yes, injury even, plenty of trouble, but not disease. I don't think I really saw it as part of my body before. That's how effective the medical dental split is. It has been like that anyway in my own personal understanding and I suspect that it's fairly common. Maybe that's something that people like yourselves could do something about. But what happened to me was this. Several years ago, a wisdom tooth went rogue in the bottom right-hand corner of my mouth so that I was chewing my cheek in my sleep. Now, saving your presence, going to the dentist isn't high on my list of fun things to do, so I put up with this for a good long while before I went and got it sorted. So I did go to the dentist, he removed the tooth, and I thought that was that. But after a couple of weeks, the sore area that had been in my cheek from chewing it at night came back and began to get worse. So I went back to the dentist. The idea of cancer never even crossed my mind. But as the sore area spread and grew, and I saw two different dentists over a period of eight months, they felt that what I had was probably erosive lichen planus, and they tried to treat it in a number of different ways. And of course, erosive lichen planus is notoriously difficult to treat, and it's a chronic condition. So none of us had any suspicions. But after eight months, and by which time I also had a hard lump in my neck, I went to my GP, and she said that this had gone far enough, and she referred me to the Max Fax Clinics in St. James's. So a lifetime of avoiding dentists and hoping that if I ignored a toothache, it would go away, had prepared me for those months of putting up with something which, if it had been anywhere else in my body, I would have taken it to a doctor faster than you could say emergency. But in the end, I did go to the Max Fax Clinic in St. James's, and they did a biopsy. 
A week later, I went back to get the results and I was admitted. My diagnosis was that I had an invasive, non-differentiated squamous cell carcinoma in my right cheek. Further tests would show that it was in my gums as well and in several lymph nodes in my neck. I wasn't discharged until nearly eight weeks, by which time I looked and felt like a completely different person. The irony of it is that during those eight months, pre-diagnosis, I sailed in and out of St. Luke's for breast checks, and I never once mentioned the presence of a tumour was so close to the surface it was visible to the naked eye. For the simple reason that I didn't know what it was, it didn't occur to me that they'd be interested in what I thought was a mouth ulcer gone mad in my mouth. All that time, my mouth was eating me. If I or any of my family or friends had known about mouth cancer, I'd have been a lot more proactive and persistent about finding help sooner than I did. As for the people I consulted, I believe they were slow to recognise the condition for what it was because I didn't belong to a recognised risk ca category. I was a woman in my 40s, a social drinker. I hadn't smoked in eight years. I had been a heavy smoker though, and the thing that doesn't often get me mentioned is that a lot of smokers will use a lot of mouthwash, and a lot of mouthwashes are alcohol-based. So I don't know if there's a scientific basis for that link or not, but I think it's interesting. Um, anyway, I'm glad that those categories don't get the same amount of credence now. No matter who presents with them, they need to be taken seriously. A suspect lesion that lasts for longer than two or three weeks needs to be followed up. So the statistics aren't great for someone who arrives at a diagnosis as late as I did. An early diagnosis means there's more chance of a cure. People put a lot of emphasis on that point, and rightly so. But bear with me a minute while I say that there's a lot more at stake than that. Because the effects of treatment aren't just cosmetic. I needed radical surgery and aggressive radiotherapy. Here's what they had to do in an operation that lasted almost 14 hours. They split my lip and lifted my face open. To remove the tumour, they had to cut out a size of a length of jaw and pieces of cheekbone, all those teeth. They peeled away the lining from my cheek and replaced it with fat from my leg. They took the lymph nodes, muscle and nerves from my neck where the cancer had spread. They took a length of bone from my leg and combined it with titanium to rearrange my face into what you see today. And I will never, ever be able to thank them enough for any of it. When I went into that operation, we thought I might lose part of my tongue. We were worried about my eye. They saved them. He saved them. I should be dead by now, and I'm not. Because of Professor Stassen and all the people who work with him, many of them either, either here tonight or going to speak to you over the next few weeks, I think. So after surgery, they stitched and stapled me back together and sent me back to the ward via the intensive care unit. I had a tracheostomy. I breathed through one tube and I was fed through another. I had to learn to walk again. Not well enough as it happened because the leg fractured and I had to be readmitted later to have it reset. I was in plaster and on crutches for months, which made the rest of my treatment hard to coordinate. But as a friend told me at the time, it was probably a bonus, because I literally had to sit still and rest. I had no choice. Otherwise, I might have been running around trying to pretend there was nothing wrong with me at all. I needed aggressive radiotherapy, which might not have been necessary if I'd been diagnosed sooner. Throughout treatment, I had various complications besides the fractured leg, issues with medication and infections, two readmissions, blood transfusions. But in the end, I muddled through it all and entered a slow process of recovery and adapting to the new me. I was treated in three different hospitals, St. James's, St. Luke's, and the dental hospital. Overall, I needed dental max maxillofacial, plastic, and orthopedic surgery. I needed radiotherapy involving oncologists and radiation therapists, not to mention the pain team and gastrointestinal specialists. I needed the work of nurses, physiotherapists, speech therapists, nutritionists. 
A small army of friends and family had to get me from appointment A to appointment B across Dublin traffic with my leg in plaster and me on crutches. My GP had to mock me up and set me on my feet again several times. All in all, I spent about 10 weeks in hospital, and all of that was because my diagnosis was a late one. This is not an insignificant or even a personal point. Think of all the money and time that could be saved in the health service if a small localised tumour can be removed as cleanly and easily as a tooth. The person can just be stitched up and sent home again in a matter of days, coming back for checks as an outpatient. I know this can happen because I've met those people. It doesn't take a genius to see that if you offer <coughs> cancer time and space to grow, it'll take it. Cancers of the mouth entrench themselves in delicate, sensitive, necessary places, meaning that the effects of either cancer or its treatment can be hard to live with. I'm not just talking about disfigurement. I'm talking about being able to open your mouth without a struggle. The ability to chew or swallow. Some people produce too much saliva and some have none at all. Some lose their sense of taste. Some faces are left expressionless. Speech can be a struggle. As time goes by, some of those functions might come back to you if you're lucky. Believe me, I'm one of the lucky ones. Here I am, nearly seven years later, talking to you, and don't worry, I'll stop soon. I know people who still can't and never will eat, speak clearly, or smile again. Think about that, what it would be like. How easy it is to avoid through awareness and early intervention. Which would you prefer if it was you? Clean, simple removal of a discrete tumour or dealing with the mess that comes later. Think of all the personnel involved, lengthy stays in hospital beds, which is cheaper, which puts less strain on the health system, never mind the person. And now I'm going to ask you to think about your own mouth, just for a minute. What's it for? It might not rank particularly high on your personal list of favourite body parts, you probably don't think about it at all, unless there's something there that bothers you. Think about all the living your mouth does for you, how social it is. It's a little like a docking station between self and others, self and world. We use it to communicate. Think how many of our interactions with other people revolve around food or drink, or how they depend on talking and being understood responding with words or a smile or a laugh to what another person says. Think how you use your mouth to express yourself, your ideas, your affection, desire. <coughs> Think about how acutely sensitive and knowing your mouth is, all it does for you, how it's intimate and public at the same time, how discriminating it is, sweet, sour, Salt, spice, hot, cold. Imagine a life with no flavour in it. If you couldn't move your tongue. And that's before we get to the basics of survival, like eating, drinking and breathing. Imagine not being able to fit your mouth around a double-decker sandwich or blow raspberries on a baby's stomach ever again. Now think about a mouth ulcer or a cold sore how excruciating a pain can be in those sensitive membranes, so richly supplied with blood and nerves, so talented at conveying sensation, whether pleasure or pain. Think how you ignore a toothache, because who has time to go to the dentist? Who even wants to go to the dentist? Think about the relief you feel when you've been, when your mouth is your own again, yours to forget about, if you're lucky. Think about it just for a minute, your mouth, how will you use yours today?